Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Um, and luckily, the snow delayed just a little bit until we could have a moment to be together, which is really nice. So today, I want to talk to you about an innovative approach to community health that is about win-win solutions for the health of people and the health of our planet. I first began to understand this interconnectedness between human and environmental health when I spent a year studying orangutans deep in the rainforest of Borneo when I was an undergraduate. Um, and at that time, Borneo was going through the fastest rate of deforestation the world has ever known. And, you know, I could hear the chainsaws every day. And it was really easy to hate these guys and assume that they were evil people. But over time, I got to know many of them, and I realized that they were in impossible situations. One man I met, um, Sofian, he cut down 60 trees to pay for one C-section, right? Like that need to pay for your short-term well-being was driving the destruction of what they very much understood as their long-term well-being. So I decided to actually go to medical school and then return to Indonesia to start a combined human and ecosystem health program. I started the U.S. nonprofit called Health in Harmony in 2007 to support this work and then teamed up with this woman, Hotlan Ampusungu, and then later we started the Indonesian nonprofit called Alam Sehat Lestari. And then we began working with the 60,000 people surrounding Gunung Palung National Park. Now, who knows how to solve the problems around this nas amazing national park with massive carbon load? and a very important place for orangutans. Well, I'll tell you who didn't know. That was me. So what we did is we sat down with all of the communities around the National Park, um, and we spent over 400 hours in that first year doing what I call radical listening. We said to them, you all are guardians of this precious rainforest that is valuable to the whole world. What would you all need as a thank you from the world community so that you could protect it? The thing that was really incredible to me about this process of just sitting down in a circle and listening to people and having them come to consensus was that every single community all the way around the National Park, 42 villages, all came to the same conclusions. And what they said was, we can stop logging and we can protect the forest if we have access to high quality affordable health care and two, we have training in sustainable agriculture, particularly in organic farming techniques. They said the traditional form of agriculture is slash and burn, and that worked well when there was lots of forest and not many people and doesn't work for us anymore. So it was very interesting to have them saying that this was the problem, not us. So we implemented their solutions in a way that would make visible that interconnectedness of human and environmental health in everything that we did. So I want to give you an example. In our clinic and now hospital, you can pay with non-cash payment options. You can pay with seedlings that we use for reforestation. You can pay with manure that we use for the organic farming training that then makes you know, healthier and more sustainable livelihoods that feeds people so that they are less likely to be sick and less likely to need to go to the hospital. This kind of um, restorative economic method of how to look at um, the problems of um, environmental destruction, that intersection between environmental destruction and human uh, well-being. You can also pay with traditional handicrafts that are made from non-timber forest products and labor where you can learn alternative uh, ways of being. Um, so in addition, in another level of restorative economic way of looking at this, um, you can also pay, you also get discounts if you come from a village that does not do any logging. And so the, the amount of logging, you get variable discounts. And those discounts are paid for by people from the other side of the planet who want to protect the environment and want to save orangutans. So this is a way to kind of tie us all in together in that restorative economic model. And it really encourages people to work together in their communities to stop the logging. So... Is this integrated approach to planetary health working? 
our method of assessing outcomes has been to combine survey data, satellite data, on the ground monitoring, uh, as well as we did a, a recent qualitative survey. Um, and so before we even started, before we did anything, we did a baseline survey of about 1,400 households, and then we repeated that at five-year mark and 10-year mark. So in that time, we've now treated over 70,000 patients in our clinic, and we now have a hospital, um, which was just completed in December of this last year. Um, so infant deaths per 100 households, based on the survey, went from 3.4 to 1.1. That's a 70% drop in just five years. Births per mother, interestingly, at the same time also declined. You know, and that's been shown all over the world, that when infant mortality drops, uh, women tend to have fewer children, but also having access to birth control helps. So then we have some of the data back from our 10-year survey. And what we found is that the prevalence of disease symptoms is also declining in these communities, quite dramatically in terms of diarrhea, fever, um, and Although cough lasting more than three weeks, which in our area is tuberculosis or often COPD, um, did go up, and although there was a big forest fire before that, so it might be, you know, this is another way that human and environmental health are very tightly linked. So what happened with the logging? Well, when we first started, there were about an estimated 1,350 logging households. Uh, that then declined to 450 after five years, and then it's now at 150, so, or as of February. So that's, that's pretty amazing, right? That's an 89% decrease. And that's almost unheard of in the conservation world, that that quickly you would have that dramatic an impact. <coughs> then, well, is that real? Those are, those are from the surveys, right? So maybe people are not telling us the truth. But if you look at, although I would also say now, uh, we actually can also monitor on the ground. We know the names of every single logger. And the number is we're counting is essentially exactly the same. So as of August uh, this last year, we were counting 140 loggers, but that was after we had already bought 13 chainsaws. So it's like very, very close. Um, and then the satellite data amazingly shows that in 2007 when our program began, we had a stabilization of primary forest loss. Now, we had lost 40% of the forest before then. It had the rate of loss had been slowing, um, partly probably because the trees were farther away. But if you look at other national parks, they continue to decline during this time period, but we have leveled off. And you can see logged forest, the red line at, is going down. There's somewhat of a delay in that because, you know, the satellite, it takes a while for the forest to recover. But you also see that the secondary forest, that um, blue line is getting better. So it's coming up, which is very exciting. Um, most of that is natural regrowth, but 93 acres of that is actually forest that we replanted. And we use that. Uh, that forest was um, planted using seedlings that patients paid for with their, their health care. Um, let me just show you. Let's see. I've got a little marker here. So this is a really important corridor. So these are all rice fields here, you can see here. And then this is all national park here. This is all national park on this side. It's a really big areas of national park. So we chose these very specific and very important areas to reforest. Um, and we reforested this corridor right in here. This whole area had been, uh, had been separated because of when people put in some rice fields. We negotiated with the folks who put in those rice fields and with the community, and they were very excited to have it reforested. So that is a habitat corridor, for, particularly for orangutans, but for all animals. And we know it's working because that um, is a selfie done by an orangutan in our camera trap <laughs> as he's checking it out. We've also seen civets, sun bears, uh, crested serpent eagles, all kinds of animals on this, um, on this camera trap. So... And then what are people doing? Well, 52% of the previous loggers are farming. They told us what the best alternative livelihood was, and they were totally right. And if you look at all the other options for what people are doing, none of them is greater than 10%. So there's a whole, there's a sort of a tail, but basically, essentially, this was the key livelihood alternative. And people are 
by all indications, wealthier than they were now, than they were back then, quite a bit wealthier, about three times their uh, income has increased. Now, income across Indonesia is also increasing, but at least people are not having, are not doing worse for having switched from logging. Um, now we're down to those remaining like 150 loggers. Now these guys turned out to be a little bit of an unusual group. Um, most people who could easily switch, switched. But then these remaining folks tended to be people who didn't own land. So, and we're often people who started logging when they were very young. So we started a new program called the uh, Chainsaw Buyback Program, where they, we start a joint business with them. They invest their chainsaw, which we buy for $400, and we then invest as kind of venture capital money, uh, another $400, and then we start a business with them. And then once they have paid back that $400, although if the business fails, we lose our money. It's not a loan. Um, they, um, once they've paid back that money, then the business is fully theirs. And they have every single one of these businesses has been wildly successful so far. And I think that this is just because, which stunned me, but I think it's just because it's so hard um, to get investment in any kind of capital investment, just like um, Fatima was talking about. It's very, very difficult. Now, I want to just point out that it's not just the men who start a business. We require that the women start a business too, their wives. Um, and that has been wildly successful. We also had this problem that the organic farming was going so well that we actually needed more animals in the community. And so we started giving goats to widows. Widows were often the most disadvantaged members of the community. Although our next executive director after uh, me, Dr. Monica Nirmala, and the program is now 100% Indonesian, um, she said, um, I can't understand why you gave all these goats to these rich widows. Well, they weren't rich when we gave them to them. <laughs> but now they're doing very, very well. Um, and so we, it wasn't exactly intentional, but our qualitative survey suggests that this part of our work was actually very important, that the empowerment of women really is very instrumental in changing uh, how the whole community is working, just as Fatima was talking about. And so, like, our program is nearly exclusively the leadership is all women. Um, and I think that also helps. One person said, um, well, you know, ASRI is a, that's the Indonesian word for the program, but ASRI is um, a women-led organization. So now we know women can do anything, right? <laughs> and one of our community health workers even became the first uh, female village chief. So that's very exciting. But, you know, people all over the world are having to face these painful choices between their short-term and their long-term well-being. And we are facing a crisis on our planet about whether or not we can even survive. So we see it's incredibly important to begin to replicate this model around the world. So we've had so much success um, in our first 10 years at our site. And I'll tell you, because I was doing it, we didn't know what we were doing. So I actually think that we can do this much more quickly at other sites as well. So we are looking at two new places that we want to start. One is called Bukit 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 Raya. That's also in Borneo. It's another national park. It's about twice the size of Gunung Palung surrounded by a community that also is very desperately poor, even more, even poorer than around Gorong Palong, um, and very little access to health care, essentially none. They, and their number one request is midwives. They also want mobile clinic visits, so we will be doing that. And they'd like training in sustainable agriculture. So, okay, we know how to do that. We will do it. Madagascar is the same. So this is a place where 80 in Madagascar, we've lost 80% of the forest in the last 10 years. I mean, it's just horrific. And the communities are desperately poor. And they have no choice, right? So we don't want that situation to be happening anywhere in the world. And we want to prove at two new sites that if, that if you find win-win solutions, we can actually do much better on this planet. And I just want to remind us, right, that if we look at <laughs> deforestation, that's actually some estimates, 18% of all carbon emissions. And Gunung Palang National Park, if it had been all logged and all burned, is equivalent to 14 years of carbon emissions from San Francisco. These are really significant for us to save. So imagine what we could do if everywhere in the world, if we had a model of radical listening everywhere in the world, 
where communities would identify what their needs are. And then we matched them with the global resources that could create the kind of win-win solutions that I believe are truly possible on our planet. And not just for them, but for all of us. So thank you very much.